All right, so yeah, I just wanted to start off by talking a little bit about this idea of bagel theology and why this is something we chose to devote a whole Sunday morning of church to, why we think it's important. Um, our services, unlike some other churches in our Metroplex, are usually well under two hours, maybe 30 minutes of talking unless Garrett's up here. So why would we have this three-hour service just full of no worship and a bunch of people talking? Um, you know, in our churches and in our focus in CTF ministries, we really heat up the value of community, um, of loving each other, loving God, and, and doing this personal ministry. We don't really believe a whole lot that sermons are going to change people's lives or that these right theologies or right doctrines are like the, the core things that we want to spend all our time focusing on. But we do believe that those are critical to our faith, that we're called to love God with our heart, our soul, and our mind. Um, and so we believe that as Christians, we need to think deeply about the things we believe. We need to think deeply about issues that are important in our world, and we need to be prepared with good, well-thought-out answers. Um, loving God with our heart is obviously essential, but we also have to know what we believe. We have to have good ideas and good thoughts about that and be able to articulate that. Um, by the way, who here doesn't have a packet yet? There's a some packets that were printed out, so I think there's some people ready to hand those out if anyone needs some. Um, so yeah, if you don't have a packet, there are some of those around. So yeah, we want to love God with our minds, and we want to be a community of lifelong learners. Uh, we don't want to just get comfortable with our 10 favorite Bible verses or our 20 pithy sayings. Um, but when we do things like this bagel theology, we're affirming together as a community um, that we believe that that loving God with our minds and, and learning about these things really matters and is really important to all of us. And yeah, I think there's just a level of depth we can get um, from some in-depth study like this that we can't get on a typical Sunday morning. So I'm really excited um, to kind of dig into this topic of Christians and culture a bit more. In 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. And then later in 2 Timothy, Paul says, Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. So notice the language Paul uses when he talks about the teaching. He says, Correctly handling the word of truth, great patience, and careful instruction. So this doesn't sound like something we can just handle flippantly and kind of do whatever we want with. But we have to be real careful about our, our, the way we talk about the word, the way we present it to others, and we have to think um, real hard about these things and, and be able to present it well. And I think this is a challenge for all of us who, who want to follow Christ. So yeah, this bagel theology is just a small way that we can start that process. We obviously can't even go very in-depth on any of these topics, even in, in the three hours that we have this morning. Um, so yeah, I hope what this will do is just kind of ignite a spark for you to want to learn more and to study these topics a bit more and to grow in your own knowledge of, in these areas. Um, Ronnie has a saying to open a file on, and I've just always really liked the image that that gives of just being people who will have these files that are open where you know we can start researching and, and putting these bits of knowledge into these files that we have open in our minds and, and not, not treating it as these closed files where I have all the answers and I know exactly what I need to know about this, but just constantly learning and adding to our, to our knowledge about these different things. So yeah, I hope you're all excited for this today. I'm really excited to hear from the people who we have speaking. Um, just as far as this specific topic that we're going through of Christians and culture, um, I chose this because I think just throughout all of history, it's been so important for Christians to understand how to engage with the culture that they find themselves in. Um, our primary mission as disciples is to make and mature disciples um, to the glory of God. And so in order to make disciples, we have to go out into our world. We have to engage with the culture around us and be able to attract people with the gospel of Christ and bring them into the fold of God. In 2 Corinthians 2.15, it says, We are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. And we see um, Paul just having this attitude of becoming all things to all men so that he might save as many men as possible. So yeah, we have three segments this morning, um, three people that I'm really excited to hear from. So Mark Merrill is going to start this morning. Uh, he's someone who I really admire as just a really deep thinker and really eloquent, um, really good at expressing 
maybe hard to understand ideas and putting them in a way that's, that's very understandable. So he's going to just kind of break down this idea of Christ and culture and, and five historical viewpoints or just kind of classic viewpoints on how different Christians have thought about engaging with the culture. Uh, after that, Ronnie and Brianna are going to come up and Bree's going to interview Ronnie. Um, and a lot of you know Ronnie Worsham, but if you don't, he's the pastor over at the Garland Northeast Church, which is the church that, that planted us. Um, and yeah, he's just someone who has a lot of life experience, a lot of wisdom dealing with a lot of different people in a lot of different backgrounds. And so just this past year with all the um, racial unrest and the election unrest and everything going on in our culture, it's been so helpful for me just even going on Facebook and seeing some of the posts Ronnie makes kind of pastoring us in how to think about that. So I wanted our church to get a chance to hear some of his pastoring on how to think through how we engage in our culture. Uh, and then finally, my good friend Grant Trotter is going to come up and he's going to talk about politics. Um, so Grant is someone who's one of my longest and closest friends. And he's, again, someone who I've just really admired for his ability to think really deeply about topics, um, to ask a lot of hard questions, a lot of uncomfortable questions, and just kind of sit with the tension between those things and not feel the need to have um, a specific set answer one way or the other. So he's got a lot of really good things to share about just how we think about politics and how we engage with people in that realm. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited for it. Let me say a prayer for us this morning and Mark can come on up and get ready to share with us. God, I just thank you for all these people here. Um, I thank you for this church and just the blessing it is um, to each of us. I say you'd be with us this morning, that your spirit would speak to us about this topic of Christians and culture, and um, yeah, that we would just be excited to engage anew with our culture and to be reaching as many people as possible with the gospel and the good news, and um, to do that effectively and, and with wisdom. Pray that you bless all the speakers this morning and that uh, you would be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, just a, a couple of items. We have some sunscreen over on the table over there, so... If you're worried about getting burned, please don't. Go just get some of that sunscreen. Uh, Mark's going to give his talk, and then after that, we'll be breaking for some bagels in between. So if you're hungry, food will be ready soon with that. So, yeah, let's invite Mark up and hear what he has to say. Uh, hello, can y'all hear me? Awesome. All righty. Uh, as James already introduced, I'm Mark Morola. Uh, I'm really uh, excited to be here with all of y'all this morning. Uh, I've been at the Wiley Church now for about two years. I first came as an apprentice with Focus, and now I work as an engineer, so I've gotten to see, I guess, culture from a couple perspectives, from the college perspective, from the work perspective, and I'm just really excited to be here with y'all today. Uh, and I'm going to start by praying. Uh, God, I pray that you would uh, give us wisdom and insight. I pray that you would help us to learn the things that you want us to learn. Uh, and I pray that you would help uh, me not to be impressive, but to be somebody who uh, teaches the word well. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. All righty. Uh, one quick ground rule, uh, I do want you to be able to interact, to ask questions, uh, interrupt if I uh, need to repeat something. So just raise a hand, just let me know, and we'll see if we have time for questions at the end. Uh, I've realized that I have a lot of material, and also Ronnie is speaking today, so the possibility of us going long today is quite high, but we're going to do our best. Uh, the other thing to uh, think about is that this uh, talk that I'm going to be giving, I'm titling it uh, Christ and Culture and Introduction, The Five Typologies of Richard Niebuhr. And this is meant to be a scaffolding. It's meant to uh, be uh, a building set so that you can put other ideas and thoughts into it. So it's going to cover a lot of material, kind of be a whirlwind, but just recognize that uh, it's going to uh, be a framework for you to put other ideas into. And so if you don't catch everything, that's okay. So uh, the focus of my talk today is on what Richard Niebuhr called the enduring problem. 
uh, which is this question of how are we as Christians to engage in culture? Uh, think about that for a moment. How are we as Christians to engage in culture? And there's no real easy immediate answer. It's been a problem for a long time, especially because Christians haven't always agreed on how we're to engage with culture. Uh, the culture is sometimes hostile to Christians uh, and how we engage with it. And so Richard Niebuhr was a German theologian who lived in the, uh, and did his best work in the 1950s uh, after the First and Second World Wars. And the environment he found himself in was one in which non-Christians were really speaking against Christians. They were saying, you've had this giant grand Christian experiment of Western civilization. Christians have really guided the church uh, or the church has guided human thought for thousands of years, and now we have two world wars, the Holocaust, the rise of communism, all of these things have gone terribly wrong. What did you Christians do? Uh, why did you allow this to happen? Uh, and that was what Niebuhr ran into. In Christ's time, he personally ran into this enduring problem of how to engage with culture, because he had a lot to say to his culture. He had uh, things to say to the Pharisees. He had things to say to the Sadducees. He had things to say to just the normal people uh, in his world. And he wanted them to change things about their culture that didn't align with God's kingdom. And this made people really upset. So, in, uh, so upset that they killed him. Uh, they crucified him because he had arguments against their culture and they didn't like that. And even in our time, we run into this enduring problem of how are we going to live in the culture. Uh, a few years back, um, many of you might have heard of the case where a Christian baker in Colorado refused to bake a wedding cake for a gay couple. And in 2018, the Supreme Court basically ruled saying, uh, yeah, the baker is allowed to, on his religious liberties, refuse to bake this cake. And it was interesting because there was conflict, uh, not just with the non-Christians and the Christians, but with Christians on how to respond to culture. Because some Christians believed, yes, this is good. Uh, we're gonna stand up for our rights. We're not going to bake this cake. We're going to stand up for what we believe is right. And other Christians were saying, no, we're supposed to love our neighbors. Uh, just bake the cake. And so even Christians disagree on how to answer this question of how are we as Christians to engage in human culture. And so uh, Richard Niebuhr was a really, really smart guy, uh, brilliant scholar, and he wrote this seminal book on Christian ethics called Christ and Culture. And it's kind of been the book that uh, has been the framework for everyone else who starts to think about how Christians and culture interact. And his big insight was that Christians have done this in many ways at different times and in different places. And he categorized all of those different ways into five typologies, which we're going to cover today. And before I get too far, I want to quickly define Christ and culture because we're going to be using those words a lot. So when I'm speaking of Christ in this context, I'm speaking mostly of Christians, of how we as Christians are going to interact with the culture broadly. And when I'm speaking of culture, I'm mostly talking of human civilization, the whole experiment of everything that Christians are doing, or sorry, everything that humans are doing, uh, whether that's politics or art or music or the way we interact with each other, food, everything. And so, I've um, made this little graph here of five different ways that we're going to cover. And there's basically two extremes, and then there's three in the middle. And those are the five typologies that Richard Niebuhr created. So uh, one other thing is just that I would really encourage you to really sort of withhold your judgment on these uh, different views until the end. You're going to find things in each view that you agree with, maybe that you disagree with, but listen to all of them, take some time to think, and allow uh, kind of approach the problem, be willing to change your mind on some of these things. So the first 
uh, view is Christ against culture. And so uh, basically Christ is here, culture is here, they shouldn't overlap. Their main conviction is an extremely high view of the Lordship of Christ. Jesus is Lord and that matters a lot. In fact, they are uncompromising with this view. No other authority can stamp their foot on the Christian other than Jesus. And so uh, the verse that they really point to is 1 John 2, 15 through 17, which I'm going to read. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. And so these Christians point out that we're not to love the world. In fact, the world is dangerous. It's corrupted. Uh, and this was a view that was heavily espoused by the early church. Uh, the early Christians really did separate themselves from Roman culture. They met in the catacombs. They weren't allowed to really engage in Christian culture or in non-Christian culture because of severe persecution. They didn't participate in politics. They didn't participate in what Rome was doing because they were doing something else. In fact, uh, a man named Tertullian who lived in the second century uh, really saw uh, Christians as a third race, uh, Jews, Gentiles, and then Christians, separate from both Jews and Gentiles in their own unique way, completely different. Uh, and these, uh, group of pe this group of people, they're separatists. They separate themselves from uh, the culture at large. And so there's people like the Anabaptists, the Mennonites, the Quakers, a lot of the uh, groups of people who left Europe and came to America to try and separate themselves from the Roman Catholic Church. That's this group. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mention that first blank there. These are the radicals. Uh, so Christ against culture, the radicals. Um, and so a couple of strengths and weaknesses. One strength is that these people really are radical. They have admirable tenacity and courage, and they really believe in the Lordship of Christ. They try to put everything that they believe really into practice. They're trying to live with Christ's authority. Uh, another strength is that it's very attractive to the disillusioned with the wider culture. So many people who were disillusioned with Roman culture came and became Christians. They saw, yeah, this whole thing where uh, Caesar is Lord and there's all this just slavery and stuff that we don't really like. We can come join the Christians and be different. And it does influence culture from the outside. They try to separate themselves from culture, but it still has a profound impact on the culture itself. And so uh, the different monastic movements, the uh, groups of people who left Europe and came over to found colonies in America, those people have had profound impacts on our culture. The early Christians in 400 years overturned Rome just by separating themselves and living a different life. Some of the weaknesses of this view are a charge of hypocrisy. You try to separate yourself, but then people still have sin. These different communities, uh, if there's an Amish community where somebody still is unable to really live up to the ideals of Christianity, then they're subject to this charge of hypocrisy. They separated themselves, but they still couldn't live up to the high ideals that they're espousing. And also that we can't really truly escape culture. Uh, even when we separate ourselves, we're still a part of culture and even have their own separatist culture. And then there's also this world be damned attitude of just, it's all corrupted, just throw it all away. That can be pretty dangerous. Uh, the next view is on the exact opposite extreme, which is the Christ of culture. So Christ of culture. And these are the accommodators. And so 
these people believe that culture is God ordained, and they point to Genesis 1, 27 through 28. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And so these people point out, God sent Christians and humanity into the world to do something, to rule the earth, to build things, to make things that are really cool, to manage the world. God ordained the culture. And so they don't see any great tension between the church and the world. They don't see any great tension between uh, us engaging ourselves in the culture. Uh, They're pretty comfortable with the culture. Uh, This group tends to be pretty selective. They take the best from culture and the best from Christianity. And so they take high culture. They say, oh, what's really cool from culture is philosophy and arts and music. We're going to take all of these things. And then uh, we're going to take a few things from Christ and Christianity that really align and mesh well with our culture. We're going to take all these things and get the best of both worlds. And so this really leads to a pretty significant intellectual streak that can be really positive. These people tend to be pretty heavy thinkers. They draw on philosophy. They draw on music and art. They really contribute to the culture in powerful ways. Some of uh, the best Christian professors uh, fall under this view. And so the danger with this view is if they align and take too much. And so a group that uh, historically didn't do a good job of this, but fell under this category was the Gnostics. Uh, They were a early group that came alongside the early church. And what they did was they really drew on Platonism, which was this Greek philosophy that was really popular at the time uh, and basically stated that the material uh, stuff is all bad and corrupt and evil and the spiritual stuff is good. And so the Gnostics took this Platonic ideal and merged it with Christianity and it ended up with an amalgamation that was uh, rejected as heretical by the early Christians. And we also see this view play out in uh, the intellectual quest for the historical Jesus, which is basically where uh, different biblical scholars try to peel back all of the layers of the New Testament to get to the real true historical Jesus. Maybe he was really a revolutionary, or maybe he was really like this peaceful monk who didn't have any conflict with the culture at all. And the danger with this is that in trying to peel back all the layers, what they really end up doing is just rebuilding Christ in the image of their culture. And so some of the strengths of this view is that it's very rational. It's very intellectual. People participate in the culture. You can make art and music really participate in that culture. Uh, It's harmonizing. Uh, There's harmony with the culture. Christians and culture don't have much conflict. And it's good news to modern humanity. Modern uh, cultures kind of love it when Christians interact in this way. We contribute some things, we take other things, meshing things to create something new. Uh, Some of the weaknesses is that this group of Christians tends to judge the against Christian uh, group, Christ against culture group, quite harshly. Their, uh, their view is that they're re- just removing themselves from culture and that that's just completely wrong. So they judge quite harshly. Another weakness is that tendency to distort the New Testament Jesus and to rebuild Christ in their image. And ultimately, this can lead to the good news becoming ineffective because if Christianity and culture become too close, uh, Christianity loses its ability to be good news, to be gospel to the world. Uh, One thing to think about with this is that this tends to be the group that a lot of Christians in America fall under. We don't encounter as much persecution as uh, Christians in other parts of the world. And so we need to be 
aware that we often wholesale take movies and arts and philosophy and participate in secular colleges and all of these different things. We participate actively in a lot of these things. And so we should be aware of these weaknesses and watch for these types of things in ourselves to make sure that we don't fall into the traps that this culture, uh, that this view uh, can really lead to. The next uh, view, this is the first of the middle median views. So we've seen the extremes, the separate completely from culture, the embrace all of culture. Now we're in the middle. First middle view is Christ above culture. These are the synthesizers. Christ above culture, the synthesizers. And so the thing to realize about this view is that this is the Catholic view. Uh, and so therefore has been the majority Christian answer to the problem of how are Christians to interact with culture. Uh, Catholics are still the majority of Christians in the world today. Uh, ever since Rome legalized Christianity and made it the state religion, uh, really until about the Enlightenment, uh, this was the main way that Christians interacted. Uh, there was this uh, whole stage of what we call Christendom, when church uh, participated actively in the politics of the world, uh, where they had a say over all of these other groups. The Pope was an authority figure. And so this is a very hierarchical view. Uh, there's the king and the nobles and the peasants. There's the pope and the bishops and the priests and the lay people. Hierarchy. There's God the Father and Jesus the Son. Uh, and there's this recognition that God is sovereign over all things. And because God is sovereign over all things, because he rules over all things, ultimately there can't be opposition between Christ and culture. There can't be ultimate opposition between God and the world because God rules it. He's still, he's the creator and he's still the governor of it. Uh, for these people, the fundamental and the uh, issue in the world isn't between God and the world, but between God and man. They see that man has sinned and there's this gap between them. And so uh, a particular proponent of this view was Thomas Aquinas. And one of the things that he really brought to the table was that since God rules over all things and created all things, we can look at all the things that he's made. We can look at the natural world and that will teach us something about God. We can look at nature. We can look at science. Uh, we can go out and look at the birds and the trees and learn something of God. And this is really powerful. Thomas Aquinas also points out that living this uh, apart from both extremes, isn't easy. A middle road is hard. It requires a lot of deep thinking, and there's no easy way to do it. Um, but that it is still necessary to do that. And so uh, a scripture we're going to look at uh, is Romans 13, 1 through 2, which says, Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. So we see that in this view, the hierarchy is set up and instituted by God for a purpose. We are to obey the church. We are to obey the state. We are to obey these hierarchies that are set in place by God to guide us. And ultimately, the uh, way that this plays out as Christians interact with culture is Christi uh, Christianity being above what culture does. And so the Christians are interacting with the pagan world and they see that pagans have Christmas trees and this uh, goddess Ishtar and uh, Christmas. And what do they do? They say, okay, we're going to subsume these things under the rule of God. And so we'll take Christmas trees and make them Christmas trees. We'll take these winter holidays and make it Christmas. We'll take this holiday devoted to Ishtar and make it Easter. We're going to take the pagan culture and we're going to synthesize and put it under the rule of God. 
the church is going to hierarchically put its mark onto the culture. Uh, so some of the strengths of this view is this search for unity of a cooperation between the Christ uh, and Christianity and the culture. This view of recognizing God's supremacy over the world uh, and therefore that we aren't ultimately in conflict with the world. Uh, and a strength that we don't often think of as a strength is this union of church and state, uh, which is strong because if the church is doing its job, then it can provide oversight to the state. It can really uh, benefit and push back against the corruption of leaders that don't uh, care about their people. Some of the weaknesses is that uh, this quest for unity may be uh, doesn't always get us the things we want. So some people really disagree with still pulling in those pagan things and say we shouldn't try to synthesize it. We're trying to pull in Christmas trees, uh, trying to pull in these pagan holidays and just convert them into Christian terms. That's not actually effective. Uh, another weakness is just that the hierarchical structure is seen as rather medieval. Uh, it's no longer really seen in fashion anymore. And then there's just been the many dangers that have occurred with uh, the union of church and state, uh, because eventually any institution tends to become corrupted over time. And so uh, the church becomes corrupt and the state becomes corrupt. And that really segues into our next view, which is Christ and culture in paradox, the dualist. So Christ and culture in paradox, the dualists. And this is the view that was really espoused by Martin Luther. And so Martin Luther lived in the uh, 15th century, 16th century, one of those two. And he saw that the ch Catholic church that he lived in was corrupted. They were uh, selling indulgences, allowing people to buy off their sin, using money to uh, achieve this relationship with God. Uh, the Pope was using his political authority to do different things that uh, Luther disagreed with. Uh, the Bible wasn't allowed to be translated into the common vernacular because only priests uh, could really understand God and needed to have the hierarchy so the lay people don't just go crazy and come up with all these random thoughts and ideas. And so Luther uh, recognized that the primar uh, primary problem is that humans are in rebellion and only God's grace can save us. So those were his two big things, God's grace and human sin. Uh, and the scripture he really looked at was Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And so he comes up with this really powerful doctrine of salvation by grace through faith. He recognizes uh, and puts out to the world this idea of total depravity, which basically means that every single part of the world has been tainted by sin, even the church, even good works. Uh, the church has become corrupt. Luther can see that. And Luther sees in himself, when I try to do good, I find corruption there too. I want to go help someone, but then pride wells up at the good deed I've just done. I can't even do good without doing evil. And so he recognizes that everything has been tainted by sin. He, and he recognizes this human condition of we are under God's wrath. God is uh, in some ways uh, above us and we're just sinning constantly. We can't escape it. Uh, and so our only response is to cry out and ask, God, save me. Uh, that's the only acceptable response. It's the only thing we can do. But even after that, Luther says we still live in this conflict. We we're now saved by grace, but we still live in this corrupted culture. We still have sin in our lives. We still live uh, between this uh, 
good spiritual things and the crappy uh, stuff in our hearts. We still uh, live between salvation and sin, between the reign of Christ and this human rule that we have to uh, go through here. And it's a paradox. There's incompatible realities that the Christian has to live with. And we really see this. We struggle with how do we live in these things? I want to do good, but I keep doing evil. I, I can't fix myself and I, I'm not being fixed immediately. How do I live in the paradox? There's this dual things of God and man trying to interact with each other. And so Luther's answer is just live. Recognize that everything is corrupted, but go out and live anyway. Go out, have a beer, participate in politics and society, um, and recognize that everything is corrupted. Uh, have a beer. He was Lutheran, uh, German. They like beer. Uh, but go out, participate in culture. Go out and do these things, but recognize that you have to admit that it's all going to be corrupted, corrupted by sin. And so uh, some strengths of this is that it mirrors that real life struggle within us. We feel this tension of, I want to fix these things, but I can't. And it really, got, just reach out to God. That's the answer. And that's a really powerful and good message. Uh, and it reinvigorates the culture and Christianity when uh, Jesus, uh, or sorry, when Luther reformed Christianity in this time, it was really powerful. He, uh, it led to a Catholic counter-reformation. It made things better. Both Christianity and culture were reformed. And uh, Another, or so those are some of the strengths. Some of the weaknesses are this tendency towards antinomianism, uh, which basically means this view that we don't actually need to follow the law anymore. Uh, because it's, I mean, we're just going to go live in the culture. Uh, we have to. We can't escape from it. Uh, so we just got to go live. Um, I mean, might as well sin. It's all God's grace anyway, um, which Luther didn't believe, but can be a tendency in this view. And then this cultural conservatism uh, of just recognizing like, okay, we live in the world, the world's corrupt, that we can't fix it, so why try? And so they might look at something like sl slavery and say, it's just there. I mean, we just got to live with it. Um, and another danger is just that this view might have too dangerous of a view of the wrath of God that leads to God being seen as not benevolent, which can be dangerous. Uh, our final typology, which is Niebuhr's favorite and also my favorite, uh, is Christ transforming culture. The conversionist. Christ transforming culture. The conversionist. And so this view really tries to take in all of the angles. Uh, it agrees with the uh, Christ and culture in paradox view that the problem is man in rebellion to God and the solution is God's grace, but it adds to that a high view of creation. And so for Luther, uh, everything's corrupted and we're trying to be saved. He focuses on salvation by grace through faith. That's his focus. But for these people, they have sort of this V structure, creation that starts off good. God made creation good. And then there was a fall and things really are bad because of that fall, but there's going to be a glorious redemption. And so there's this arc of uh, transformation as God restores what was lost. Um, and culture is converted, not replaced. And so the scripture to look at there is John three sixteen through 17. For God so loved the world, that whoever uh, believes in him shall, uh, or for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So God's not here to condemn the world and get rid of it, but to save it, to redeem it, to restore it, to make it new. And the way that this happens is through conversion. 
uh, a major figure for this is Saint uh, Saint Augustine, uh, who is a uh, man I believe in the fourth or fifth centuries during the fall of Rome, and he uh, had this crazy life where he lived in different cults and participated actively in these different uh, just sinful practices in life. But he eventually was converted. He changed his mind. He saw the view that Christians espoused and he believed in it and he converted. And he had, uh, and this conversion really changed his life. And because of that, he believed that uh, Christians needed to convert the culture as well. And so he wrote this really uh, important book called uh, The City of God. And he basically espoused this view of there's the city of God and the city of man. And slowly the city of God is be transforming, coming into invading the city of man and making it new. Uh, so Christians have something to give to the culture. They can bring in human rights. They can bring in uh, these uh, they can join politics, they can join uh, civil service, they can make the world better, they can end slavery, they can help cure poverty. Uh, they can do these different things that make the world a better place. Um, and this Protestant work ethic comes from this view of we can get out of there, we can go into the world, we can work really hard and we can make things better. And so some of the strengths of this uh, view is that it really takes into account that whole structure, creation, fall, redemption. It takes into account the whole of God's story. It contributes positively to the culture. Christians go out and go and do good things. And it recognizes God's sovereignty over all creation and that God's not abandoning the world, but fixing it uh, and making it new. And uh, some weaknesses is that it tends towards perhaps unbridled optimism of the cultural experiment. Uh, maybe tends to believe like we can achieve utopia, which can be really dangerous. Uh, another weakness is that Christian participation in the culture can often be rejected or overlooked by non-Christians. They just don't appreciate what Christians are trying to do. And it may also tend towards universalism, which is when it uh, goes too far is the belief that uh, Christians or that all people will be saved, saved, even those who don't necessarily believe in God, because they point out that God's redeeming all of the world. And so everyone is part of the world. So it's going to pull along everyone with him, uh, which has been seen as uh, heretical by most Orthodox Christians. And so a real quick review of what we just covered, if you want to go back to page one, that line there. We covered the Christ against culture people separating two different uh, places. Christians don't interact with the culture. The other extreme, Christ of culture. We're going to embrace culture. Uh, we're going to participate fully in everything Christian has. And then three in the middle, Christ above culture. Christ is going to be uh, the authority that teaches uh, culture what to do. Uh, above culture, Christ and culture and paradox. We can't fix everything, so we're just going to live in it. Um, and Christ transforming culture, uh, Christians are going to go into the world and we're going to make things new. And so a few key takeaways uh, from this are that uh, Niebuhr recognized there's probably no one right typology. Th at different times, different typologies are different valuable in different areas. So Christ against culture, really viable when uh, there's uh, a lot of persecution. Uh, Christ above culture was really viable when the church and state were one and the same. Um, but there's different things to draw from each. There's different answers to the enduring problem of how Christians are to interact with the culture. Uh, another uh, takeaway uh, is that we should know which one we try to tend towards. I would really encourage you to think through these typologies and think, where do I tend to fall? And maybe which ones do I agree with most? So I can avoid the weaknesses of the typology that I tend to go along with. And then a final takeaway is one that Peter Young taught us at uh, Apprentices last year, is that what you think changes how you live. You'll notice that with each of these typologies, I explained basically the theology, the thought process behind uh, the group, 
and then how that impacts the way they go out and interact with the culture. And so theology is important. The way we think really will change the way we interact with the world. And then my final encouragement to you is just that this is really hard. There aren't easy answers. Interacting with the culture is hard. And so it's important to remember that we aren't alone. God gave us his spirit so that as we go out and live in the world, we aren't alone. And I'm going to uh, leave you with an encouragement from John 14, 15 through 18 and 26 through 27. This is uh, Jesus to his disciples. If you love me, keep my commands and I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you will know him for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. All this, uh, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. So I'm gonna pray. Uh, dear God, I thank you so much for putting us in this really amazing world with uh, politics and art and culture, all of these things that we get to interact with. And I pray that you haven't left us here alone. I thank you that you've given us your Holy Spirit uh, so that we can think well about how to interact with it. I pray that you would give us wisdom and insight and help us to uh, really interact with the culture in a way that honors you. In Christ Jesus' name, amen.